Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, today we're going to be chatting about linking multidisciplinary assessment information to whole child service coordination care, which is a mouthful. Um, I'm Kate Cordell and I'll talk to you a little bit about my background here in just a moment. Um, but the key topics we're going to cover today are the uh, system of care and how we can use technology to actualize that ability to integrate the system of care. Um, we're going to talk about data interoperability, shared data, and a little bit about AB 2083 and how to remove technology barriers for that. And we're going to touch on health equity as well. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm Kate Cordell and I'm Managing Director of Mental Health Data Alliance. I'm also co-founder of OPICO, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about. And I'm Assistant Professor at the University of Kentucky Center for Innovation and Population Health. And through my work over the last several years. Um, my goals, I've identified my goals to really improve the use of information to support person-centered care, to evaluate when individuals and families are improving during care, to identify what works for whom, and to develop a movement for success-focused um, intelligence versus uh, looking for who, predicting who will fail. How can we predict how to help people succeed? Um, and through that, we will be able to remove or filter out institutional bias. So uh, what is the whole child when we talk about the whole child and um, the system of care? The whole child includes a lot of different areas. If we think about the whole child, we're thinking about not only the academic and the social and the recreational and the cultural, we're thinking about emotional, we're thinking about spiritual purpose. Uh, we're thinking about the physical aspects of the child, um, nutritional, financial, productivity, safety, uh, the environment, and, and just the ability to complete activities every day to function, so activities of daily living. There's a lot of different domains to consider when you're thinking about the whole child. So when we serve a whole child, we really need more than one system to address all the different areas that a child and a family may have uh, need for, need in, areas with need. And so the system of care really is this idea that we can address a whole child through these different agencies of mental health and substance use and primary care and, and justice with family sitting in the middle. And the idea is that a system of care would be this organized and coordinated network with this supported infrastructure to allow collaboration across all of these different agencies this, in this system of care. So that's the idea um, that's been you know, proposed over the years about how to best engage and, and serve whole children and whole families. And so, in considering a system of care back in 2014, when I was a graduate student at the University of California, Berkeley School of Social Welfare, um, I thought about how, you know, how, you know, we were given this challenge, how to address mental health, behavior, health, families, uh, and children. How do we, how do we promote well-being for children? And in that uh, thesis I developed, you know, schools stood out as this, this key doorway through which we could identify children's needs and children's strengths. Children spend so much time in school and they're, most are connected, if not all are connected in some way to school, even, even from a homeschool situation. You know, a school has access to children, to understanding children, their needs and their strengths and their well-being. And so if we put schools kind of as this central piece in the system of care for children, then we can create this tiered system approach. You know, and I've heard other talks in Breaking Barriers with uh, where schools are doing that three-tiered approach and identifying uh, needs in children early and, and you doing the prom promotion and prevention. Um, and so in 2014, when I conceptualized, um, you know, what a, a school-centric solution would be for promoting child well-being. You know, I proposed this school family community partnership with these three tiers um, where we would promote positive youth development, prevent mental disorder, assist recovery from mental illness. It was all very, um, you know, best world kind of thinking. Um, and as I went through that thinking uh, and that thought process in developing that, that approach, 
you know, there were several things to consider. There were student, you know, what where there were low needs, moderate needs, intensive needs, and who was going to compensate for each of those different services um, based on need? Because we know with Medi-Cal or Medicaid, there's a necessity there. So what if it doesn't meet necessity? You know, how are we going to fund the different promotion, prevention, <clears throat> and treatment options? And how are we going to coordinate it? It certainly can't be all done by and through the school. And where is it going to be located? And, you know, schools have hours. And what about after hours and, and transportation? And, and then who's going to provide the service? Is it going to be provided by school staff or outside of school staff? And do we need this community partnership? And how are we going to kind of matriculate students through this um, level of service so that they get the service they need. And then how are we gonna track that students receive the service and that um, we're monitoring our infrastructure? And so I was thinking about all of these things, all of these the complex working parts of how schools could really sit at the center of children's well-being. Um, and and in that research, you know, I just identified or found from from the research that what's really important is having shared goals, responsibility, information, and process across across the system of care. You have to have a shared grip, like handing off of a baton. You know, the, you need to share a grip, um, goals, responsibility, information, and process. And what that really means is that we're doing assessments and we're we're assessing um, and identifying goals that may be specific to our, our part of the system of care, but that can be shared across the system of care. Um, we have our own de definition of success, but that sits under an umbrella of a larger definition of, of success for a whole child. Um, in process, that means our activities don't work against each other, that there's um, a workflow between the different systems when we hand off that baton and that we're monitoring not only our own outcomes, but we're keeping an eye on outcomes that are the focus of other agencies in that system of care um, and other domains in that child's whole well-being. And we share responsibility for that because we know a whole child can't be well if there's one area out of place. And even if it's not the area that we focus on, we're identifying how to help those other areas um, we're sharing that problem solving and decision making um, responsibility. And then we're sharing information and communicating information about the whole child uh, through evaluation of the results and, and change over time and progress. And only then can we really have a system of care if we share these different areas. <clears throat> but what I found, uh, you know, through the consultation that I've done over the last decade um, in California for uh, Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission for Department of Healthcare Service for the Department of Social Service is that the system of care does not look like the flower uh, presented earlier very often. It more often looks like uh, caps for sale with a family wearing multiple caps on their head um, depending on their need. They may have a cap for education and mental health and substance use and you know some physical challenges with primary care and and, and so the system really just sits on top of the head of the family stacked on there um, kind of in an uncoordinated fashion. Even though we want to coordinate, there's so many barriers to getting that coordination. So I've spent the last 10 years finding ways to try to piecemeal together different technology solutions to help, for example, San Francisco's um, family child welfare services connect data and information with the mental health services um, through technology so that we get a whole picture <clears throat> of a, a child that is um, served across different agencies in a system of care and built a tool for that, but that was not going to solve the problem long term. So thinking uh, over the years, how do we create a shared grip in, in, in a sustainable way? How do we create shared goals in a sustainable way um, and share that responsibility and in the information and processes? And we've heard in some of the talks, you know, through the <clears throat> conference this week that folks are doing that in, in, in these, these um, initiatives and they have these great leaders that are creating these initiatives to create this shared grip and to have this three-tiered system in, in schools or <clears throat> across communities to, to really perform um, what's something that looks closer to a system of care. But what happens when those leaders change or when the grant runs out? 
Um, how do we sustain a system of care if it's if it's a lot of handing off and a lot of coordination through a great leader, but a great leader who may move on or may not be there tomorrow. And what we really need um, is to remove the technology barriers so we're not handing off pieces of paper um, in a physical sense or mailing uh, paper to each other um, in, in the COVID world or emailing PDFs that we have some sort of coordinated system where we can see and work with each other in an efficient manner. And so through this thought experiment, how would that be done in the easiest, most simplest way? How could we share just the information that's needed, but not everything? We don't need to, the school doesn't need to share all of its records with mental health and mental health doesn't need to share all of its records with the school. And child welfare doesn't need to share everything it knows with mental health, only the pieces that mental health needs. We need to be able to share the information that helps us have that shared grip, but not overwhelm each other with all of the details about the work and the focus that we do. So in that thought experiment, I thought, what if we shared assessments? And not every assessment, but the one that mattered, the ones that cross over between the different systems of care. What if we had a system that connected the systems through shared assessments of our choosing and assessments? Why assessments? How do we identify well-being in the whole child? What do we do to identify how a child's doing culturally, emotionally, productively? We assess. Assess is the evaluation or estimation of the nature, quality, or ability of someone or something. And schools use assessments. Child welfare uses assessments. Just, juvenile justice uses assessments. Developmental services uses assessments, mental health, behavior health, primary care. Assessments are used across all of the different agencies in the system of care. And it is the only approved means for measuring behavior health outcomes. There are no other. It is assessments. And until we have chips placed in our head to identify what it is we're feeling and how it is that our circumstances may have changed we need to ask through assessments. We are gonna ask in standardized ways, how are you doing? What are your needs? Can we build your strengths? And that's gonna be done through assessments. What are assessments used for generally? They're used for screening, referral, placement, level of care determination. They were used for matching the right staff to the right family or the right family to the right program. They're used for goal setting, for safety planning, for action planning, for service selection, for treatment planning, for outcomes management, for program completion decisions, for transitioning, for program evaluation, for fidelity and effectiveness. Assessments are at the heart of everything we do. And so if we're going to share of assessments, and, and, and that's going to be how we begin to create this communication line so that we can share goals, responsibilities, information process. Well, which ones should we use? We should clearly use the ones that measure well-being. So maybe that's a, P a PHQ-9 or a PREPARE, or maybe it's about social functioning. Perhaps it's about the parent report. Perhaps we're looking for acceptance and action, or we're looking for happiness, or we're looking for psychological functioning. Maybe we're looking for social needs, perhaps maybe a psychiatric rating scale, maybe insomnia. Maybe um, these other questions about food and, and substance use. Maybe it's a pediatric symptom checklist. Perhaps it's a CANS. Maybe it's a RAPID. How about a post-PTSD assessment? What about the HUDAS? What about the, the general anxiety disorder? There are so many different kinds of assessments, tens of thousands of different kinds of assessments. And if we are going to think about a whole child, we can't use one assessment. We have to use the assessment that gives us the information we need for the area of focus that we have. And for every one of us, that's going to be a different set of assessments. So we can't just all decide that we're gonna use the cans and then move forward. Although that may cover many of these areas, there's going to be other areas that we need to ask about or need to focus on. 
So continuing that thought experiment, knowing that we need to be able to share assessments, but we can't a priori decide which assessments we're going to share. We have to be open to sharing what's needed for that family and being open to asking questions of that family that are going to serve the purposes of the work that we're going to do. So continuing on that thought process from 2014 when I was writing this paper, I continued to think what would solve this problem? How, if, okay, so if we're going to share assessments, we can't just decide on one. We have to collect, be able to collect and share any type of assessment depending on the circumstances and the needs of that family. We have to store those assessments in a standardized way that's electronically accessible and shareable across systems. We have to convert the responses of those assessments into something meaningful. I don't want to share a PDF of some bubble checked um, assessment. I want to share meaningful information that I can convert into reports and evaluations. I want to look at track. I want to track over time. I want to see change in responses because why am I doing the work that I'm doing? I'm doing it to improve well being. So I want to see those well being indicators, those safety indicators. I want to see them move in a particular direction. I need to look at change over time. I need to support my own definition of success. While we may have a definition of success for the whole child and whole family overall, I am focused in my agency and system of care on my definition of success. And that may be academic, it may be safety, it may be mental health and well being. But I need to focus my work on that success, although keeping in mind a definition of success of the other areas and the overall definition of success. And I need to share that, that definition and that information across the system of care because ultimately we're talking about a whole child and a whole family. If we were able to do that, those first six things, then we would have the ability to automate evaluation and monitoring and continuous quality improvement. We'd be able to ascertain what works for whom because we'd have the information over time and we'd see that success and we'd see our our. Our, our efforts meeting that definition of success. And if we could do that, if we could know what works for whom, we could identify and remove biased decision processes. What's not needed. So in this investigation and in this thought experiment that I did over these years, things that I identified that were not needed, we don't need another electronic record system. There's plenty of them. There's electronic health record systems. There's you know, school record systems. There's a lot out there that, that are very specifically designed for a single entity, their processes, their regulations, their laws, their auditing. They're oriented toward achieving that one agency's goal, that one area of the system's goal. They're very rigid in the rules and they don't adapt. And as we mature and we learn what works best as we collaborate, another electronic health system is not going to to serve our purposes. We can't all, we can't create one ginormous electronic record system and say we're all gonna log into it and that's where we're gonna store everything about a whole child. That's not feasible today and maybe in 10 or 20 years, but not today. Assessments are questionnaires essentially. So why not something like SurveyMonkey? There's hundreds or thousands of uh, questionnaire or survey software out in the market. Why not just use one of those? Well, they, pretty much all think about questionnaires as a one-time effort, effort. You ask one question to an individual, it's usually focused on sampling, sampling, not, in, not asking everybody you serve, but a sample. Um, and then it has little coordinated processing. These survey tools, they don't process the information to these visually informative um, layouts. They don't apply individual screening. Um, or algorithms at the person level, you can't track change over time. There's no infrastructure for sharing and they're generally not secure. So you cannot ask HIPAA related questions in them. There's no good survey tool on the market that would create an, an area where we could share assessments. So what do we need? We need a system that allows us to share assessments and outcomes for the whole child that interacts or interoperates between different health records, electronic records, academic records that we already have. We need something that brings together just the information that we need to share and not all of the information that we need to track. So who's going to build this? Who would build this? Who would, who would 
take on the responsibility to work across all of those different agencies, identify which assessments they're using. Maybe they'll it'll change tomorrow. They certainly want to change the wording and which questions and everything. So how are we going to identify what to build? So here's what we need to do. If we're going to build that system, we need a system that's going to collect all types of assessments in the same way. We need it to have a standardized, standardized ways to identify what questions are so we can handle them in different ways. Different questions ask different things. There's questions that ask about needs and there's questions that ask about strengths. And those familiar with the CANS understand that this is kind of one of the foundational pieces that CANS is built on. Let me just jump ahead. So in the CANS, or in, in this isn't a CANS question, but in, in, in any, any type of question or assessment, you can have questions that say, in the past week, how many times did you feel so angry that you exploded? That's going to be a need. And you, or the question might say, in the past week, how many times something went wrong? Were you able to calm yourself so that you did not explode? Well, now you're talking about strengths. So every question really focuses on needs, strengths, but there's other types of questions. There's questions that ask you about traumatic experiences. There's ones that ask you about past behaviors. Have you ever, did, were you ever arrested? Did you ever have a suicide attempt? Did you ever, these past behaviors long ago, were you ever addicted to drugs? Uh, these past behaviors are not modifiable, but there's things that we need to know that inform how we're going to address and um, help improve well being. There's also questions about supports and support needs and support resources. These are caregiver, caregiver needs, caregiver strengths, um, natural support areas for needs and strengths. There's questions about goals. What are your goals? There's questions about are you satisfied with your service or with your life? There's questions about your preferences. Do you prefer this versus that? Um, and there's questions about circumstances, simply just identifying what are your circumstances stances. And most questionnaires will have questions that fall into one of these 10 categories. And if we can identify what each question is, we can then identify if it will change over time. And if we want it to change over time, if we know it, what each question is, and we know if we want it to change over time, we are well on our way to identifying what our outcomes are and our definition of success. We can't we can't change things that have happened in the past. And so we are not looking for those changes over time. Those don't become our outcomes. We're looking for building needs, uh, uh, addressing needs, building strengths, improving supports, achieving goals, and improving satisfaction while considering preferences, circumstances, culture, past behavior, and trauma. The next thing we need to do is we need to store these assessments in a standardized electronically accessible format. I'm not talking about uploading a PDF or an image. I'm not talking about creating a table in your data warehouse for every single different type of assessment. I'm talking about creating an extensible model where you can store that information and exchange it in a in, in very quick manner. I'm talking about the ability to add any assessment you want, even one you make up off the top of your head within 30 minutes into the system. It's there and it's available for you to screen on within 30 minutes. I'm talking about sharing assessments in that standard format. If we're, if we're storing them in a standard format, then we can electronically exchange that information very easily because we all understand that standard format. And we're talking about completing assessments and then immediately generating visualizations. So as soon as that assessment is complete, we are receiving reports on what that assessment is telling us about how it's changed from the last three we've taken for that family or that child. In order to do that, we need to have a response handling system. We need to be able to customize how responses are handled. In one program, I might identify a lower threshold of a response for another. So if I'm talking about juvenile justice, and I'm asking about recreation or free time. If there's a lot of recreation or free time in that program for those kiddos, I might set a really low threshold that that's something we need to address. If I'm talking about a child that's just been removed from a really restrictive home where they've had no free time, then I'm gonna set a different threshold for allowing free time. We need to be able to customize how responses are handled and how we define a response in terms of how it should be handled and how it should feed into our definition of success. 
for one child, having more free time is towards success and whole uh, child well-being. And for another child, it's on the opposite spectrum or the opposite direction. We need to be able to handle these responses in a way that's specific to the child, the family, the program, and the type of care we're trying to provide. We need to be able to convert those that information as soon as it's collected into something that's meaningful. So in the, if we were able to um, identify types of questions and then identify response thresholds, we could um, automatically convert those into story maps so that we know if this question is answered over this threshold, it becomes a need and it's a targeted need for, for what it is that I'm trying to do. And that moves all of the information into a, uh, a story map. It can also move the information directly into a family report. As soon as I take that assessment, that looks like one of the assessments you saw earlier with the bubbles, it can export like this so that a family can understand the results of what it is that they've just assessed on instead of a series of bubble sheets snapped together. We can also provide change over time so that staff can look and monitor different changes over time. If we had these questions identified as strengths or needs and trauma experience, and we knew thresholds above which were specific to the type of care that we are trying to provide, then we can implement these automatic level of care placement algorithms that have been um, identified by experts in the field so that as soon as an assessment is completed, you get the recommendation about a level of care. And that may be a step up or it could be a step down alert. So if we could, now that we have this operationalized set of assessments, we can now identify when recommended step up or step down care is should be a, a considered based on our needs um, and the experts in our local area and what they think. We need to share assessments and outcomes across different electronic health records. But how are we going to do that? What does that look like? It's easy to say, but it's difficult to operationalize. What we need to do is we need to set up these collaborations for sharing. If we had the system that connected different electronic record systems and its goal was to be the glue between these different electronic record systems, then it would allow us to set up collaborations and identify which assessments, which questionnaires we wanna share, because those are the ones that are important for my partners to know, my partners in care to know. So it would need to be able to have the ability to set up a collaboration. And for example, this is a school-based wraparound collaboration where I'm sharing the CANS and the wraparound fidelity index with my partners. I'm assigning people to that, um, students to that wraparound and then I'm identifying my sharing, my collaborative unit. So here I'm sharing that wraparound fidelity index and the CANS with mental health provider, juvenile justice, education, and uh, county family services. And so I've identified this is my sharing group and these are the assessments I'm gonna share and they can share back to me the different kinds of assessments that they wanna share. But we, may have questions on the assessments that we can't share. There are specific questions on some assessments that need a release or are too sensitive or the family may not want other partners to know about, the child may not want to know. So it needs to have the ability to mark things as confidential. We need to be able to say, I wanna share all of the assessment, but not this question or not this set of questions. The system needs to be able to do that. We need to be able to capture not just the voice of the experts, but the voice of the family and the voice of the children. A lot of these things are, are, are asking them about their culture, or their preferences, or their, um, and that may be different between parent and child. We need to say, this is what the parent thinks, and this is what the child thinks. Does, does mom or dad have a, a, a substance use problem? The child, yes, the parent, no. We need to, be able to capture those different voices, those different opinions. And we need to be able to track whose opinion are we tracking. Very importantly, I worked so hard toward this, we need to support data quality. It is not going to serve anyone if what we collect isn't collected uh, 
on time, uh, isn't collected at a regular schedule, isn't collected at all, or is quickly collected and it contains garbage information. So we need a system that's going to support data quality by coordinating schedules between assessments that may be needed by different uh, agencies in a system care and to create reminders so that we avoid those missed assessments. And then uh, further has a way to find, identify when those assessments perhaps were not completed fully, were not completed accurately, and might need a second look. We need to promote health equity across assessments. Some assessments, when we set a threshold, are culturally biased. The GAD-7 has been found that if we're, we set a threshold on the GAD-7, that is going to under-recommend a treatment for African Americans. So if we just set our algorithm and uh, on these assessments and say, this is our definition of success. This is where we're gonna you know, identify people uh, who need treatment. And we don't go back and look at that. We may be creating another biased institutionalized decision process. So we need a system that's gonna have immediate real-time insights. So the second that a decision is made, that's not the right decision for that person, or maybe it's a biased decision, we are identifying that. We need to look for what works for whom. We need a system that's going to identify when decisions are being made over and over again that are resulting in under care for certain populations. And we need to identify and remove that bias. As soon as the assessment is completed, um, these data points can be added in, into um, automated models that identify uh, if that person is uh, meeting the need. And, and if we're identifying groups of people too often that don't meet need, and we can build models for that in R and Python, but what if the R and Python were connected directly so that as soon as the assessment was completed, it learned, and it learned what kind of decision process we were making. We need to remove bias, but we don't do that by creating machine learning models that predict who's going to fail. Most machine learning models that you've heard about are about predicting who's gonna recidivate, predicting who's gonna fail. These models are not helping us. We need to visualize who could succeed. We need to create success-focused models. Look at when people succeeded, what supports did we offer them? What circumstances did they have that changed that resulted in that success? And how do we repeat that for people who look like them that we see tomorrow? We need to visualize who could succeed in these models. Those models look so much different than the ones that predict who can fail. Models that predict who can fail are, are the models that we've all heard about in the weapons of mass destruction and other areas. And those look at different indicators that put people in these buckets and repeat the, the, the poor decisions that we make over and over again. A success-focused intelligence system reinforces good by including the result of decisions in the model and looks for ways to, re, to improve and repeat good decisions. It's a different way to set up a model, uses some of the same tools in the toolkits, but looks and includes different aspects of the model because we're looking for positive outcomes. We're not trying to flag people who will fail. We're looking at how can we improve so that we can help more people succeed. We need to build those types of models into our systems. So we're identifying how to help people succeed. And when people don't succeed, what is it that we could do better next time? Those models can't exist with the same tools that those destructive models were built on, but we've got to do it in a success-focused fashion. Those are the things that a system would need but who is gonna build a system like that? Well, I've been thinking about this a long time. So I built it <laughs> and it does all of those things. Um, 
over the last few years, I've written hundreds of pages of design specification documents. Um, and I built these success focused models. And I'm sorry, I'm getting like, I spent so much time working on trying to figure out how can we stop solving the problem one, one single agency at a time and really create a system of care, an interoperable system of care. And so I looked for ways to fund a project like this. And um, it, is a, it is difficult because it needs to be HIPAA compliant. It needs to be secure. It needs to be interoperable. It needs to support models and workflow um, it, this, to standardize the information, it's it's not it's not something that's often done to to be ready to collect any type of information without knowing what information that's going to be. Um, so I spent time building that data model, and then I pitched that idea to local local investors um, like Dale Carlson, who uh, lives in foster care. And uh, anyway, I don't know why I'm getting maybe it's the election. It's getting me all uh, emotional. But um, anyway, I found a local investor who agreed to be a mentor to figure out how to fund this project. Uh, and we funded it and we built it. And it does all of those things. It, it, it can t identify whole child well-being up from any type of assessment. We can put it in in 30 minutes. We can... Um, look at person and process measures, uh, not just person, but also process measures. We can capture needs, strengths, exposures, past behaviors, support needs, support resources, circumstances, pre preferences, opinions, goals, and we can handle that information so that it's um, looked at in a visually appealing way as soon as the assessment is collected. And really, this is what we, I think, can help support shared grip. We can track assessments over time and look at outcomes based on our own definition of success. We can look at our system strengths and we can automate our ability to look at those strengths. We can remove institutionalized bias because we can identify it. And we can support person-centered care. And uh, we are rolling out uh, this system um, to a couple agencies in, uh, as well as to the in, to England foster care system. Um, and so they're, they're beginning to uh, uh, make plans for training on on this system. So I'd really like some more volunteers uh, uh, for an advisory committee so that we can figure out how something like this could work for for California. Um, and if not this solution, you know, certainly help you build the solution that would work. But uh, but this is what I think that uh, a system of care could use in order to support that type of technology. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there and uh, uh, see if we have any questions. Okay, thank you. It's Rich Connect with the Breaking Barriers Group. I really appreciate your time, expertise, and passion this morning on uh, connecting our assessment systems and um, synchronizing, if you will, the critical information that informs service planning and ultimately uh, both um, student and youth level outcomes and the organizational outcomes uh, as well. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A and we have ample time for other questions that you can go to the Q&A box uh, prompt down below and put your questions in. Um, Kate, the first question is relatively general. Um, how are you sharing this information? For example, are you obtaining re uh, releases of information? Um, so if you can reflect a little bit on uh, kind of the operational needs that organizations would need to put in place uh, to make something like this actionable, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. So it's no different than if you were to share paper, right? So uh, pay, pay, it, this just makes that um, ability to share easier. So once you have those either data use agreements, data sharing agreements, release of information from the people you're serving that you would need anyway um, to share information in a CFT, a child and family team, or anything like that, all the same rules apply. This just makes it easier. So um, you, the, uh, the system would need to be able to say, sharing only occurs if there's an ROI, um, that ROI needs to exist, then let's turn sharing on, right? So um, th that all applies. 
in the same way that it would if you were sharing in any other way. It just removes the difficulty in sharing. Appreciate that. Um, let's see, uh, wondering, uh, does OPICA stand for something in particular? Is that an acronym for uh, a functional? No. <laughs> no, it doesn't, but maybe we should think of one. No, OPICA doesn't stand for anything in particular. All right. Um, Kate, I wonder, um, while we wait for potentially other questions to come in, if you could reflect a little bit more um, deeply on the implications of the kind of back end or macro data when, when a system, when, when multiple partners within a system hypothetically are able to synchronize their system in a manner that you're, um, that you're proposing here. Um, talk about the implications from a performance standpoint, if you could just elaborate a little bit more on what the value might be from your perspective for that. The value for uh, the different systems? Uh, or for the system as a whole in terms of performance monitoring? Oh, performance Out monitoring. Outcomes sorry. management. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you're able to join together the different assessments um, and look at kind of the whole child, then we can look at performance in terms of, you know, are they doing well academically? Is the uh, sleep or the primary care, or the physical related issues associated with that? academic performance. And so if we're looking across the different systems or the different agencies in the system of care, then we can um, get a greater picture and, and identify that, you know, maybe academic isn't the focus right now because there's safety and physical issues that need to be addressed first. So I'm going to back off on my area um, on the academic side and, and help and support the physical and safety issues on, on the other side. So really that coordination is one of the benefits. And then in terms of monitoring the outcomes over time, you know, I'm not going to um, evaluate my system on simply just academics when I'm thinking about the whole child. So we're gonna be able to contextualize our outcomes into a broader definition of success um, in addition to our own individual success that we may be tracking now. I don't know if that answered your question, Richard. Yeah, no, I love that. And just from a, a system of care design um, standpoint, so often the investment in program design or implementation of an evidence-based model, for instance, the, the outcomes are only evident when you are in partnership with others. I think of some of the great examples of where, uh, you know, the Juvenile Probation Authority, for instance, in California has state funds for prevention and they invest those through a partnership. They often end up actually keeping kids out of hospitals, keeping kids out of the welfare system. So it's only when you are kind of interconnected in terms of outcomes monitoring that you see the return on your investment. Um, so it's really a, it's a fascinating concept. I've um, got a number of other questions that have come in. Um, at the risk of getting uh, technical, Kate, could you just elaborate for about 60 seconds on how you develop the algorithm component underneath uh, your product? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a couple different uh, components that, that have algorithms. Uh, one is a ability to implement uh, parenthetical logic through a, a decision tree algorithm, similar to the one that John Lyons and April Fernando create. Um, and so I've developed a, a model for implementing that decision care algorithm, um, which is really just a, a pretty straightforward rules-based algorithm. Um, and so that can be automated based on the, the question answers. Uh, in addition to that, you set the thresholds. Um, and I think I showed a picture of that earlier. This is the rule-based one. Let's go back up here. Uh, this one here. So you set the threshold and then you identify what combination of, um, of, of question answer possibilities you want to, to result in that decision th threshold. So the algorithms are completely customizable based on the ones you already have in place or the ones you develop with John Lyons and April Fernando if you're talking about the CANs or the ones you want to test out 
So um, I do not develop the algorithm decision trees. I just implement them uh, so that they can be automated. So you get the result as soon as the assessment is completed or the set of assessments are completed. That's the one area. And then the other area is more of the ability to support higher level analytics, including regression, um, you know, latent class analysis, uh, neural networks, uh, recursive partitioning, you know, this higher level ability to look at data in a way where we can learn from those patterns that's implemented through R and Python. It's completely integrated with the data. So I have a 10 minute delay, but 10 minutes after an assessment is completed, that data is cleaned, transformed and imported into either R or Python of your choosing. Um, I have models in both that I've developed and uh, it will push out within 10 minutes. This is a recursive partitioning tree here. Um, within 10 minutes after the assessment's built, uh, completed, you have the ability to add that information into this recursive partitioning. That's a random force and a recursive partitioning built in R. And it was, like I said, within 10 minutes of that assessment being completed, it's pushed into these models so that these models can continue to learn about your local population as you work. So if your population trends change, these trends change because they are built um, in R and Python learning models. Um, we also have the ability for analysts to uh, log in to this workbench here and create their own R and Python models from that data. That's fascinating. So hypothetically then, uh, um, I could be a child welfare case manager and my education partners have just completed some assessments associated with the request for an IEP um, for, a, for my, you, our shared student and those are uploaded and I would get an email telling me those assessments are done now and they've been incorporated into the larger, um, the larger um, analysis. Yeah, I can, yep. I can yeah, assuming all the right organizational releases are in place, I can now see that, that information. That's right. And, and I mean, this is more of an aggregate model that you're looking at here. Um, there's always, there's a individual level information that looks and tracks over time. So this is kind of an individual level report. So you can see uh, in this example, you had psychosis um, increase and uh, it looks like uh, substance abuse also increased in this example. So, um, so yeah, so you can see change of time as soon as they're completed. If you're in a sharing, a collaborative environment and you've shared that particular assessment, then you would get that information as soon as it was completed. And not only that, if you are a couple of agencies that are uh, collaborating on the same assessment, like the CANS, which could be used across multiple different agencies in a system of care, you can fill out your section and then the other folks can log in and fill out their section. So you can fill out the assessments together across different agencies. That's fantastic. And just for just for confirmation, now you have one agency in Southern California using this. You have an organization in Florida, and you have the Nation of England now that's signed on. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it's Georgia, but uh, yeah, go Georgia. Georgia. Um, it's in Georgia, <laughs> and uh, and then England is is um, yep, they're they're working on uh, getting on right now as well and starting to train. And then one final question, and I, I think the answer is affirmative, but. Um, the, the, do you need to train all the partners then on the various assessments collected so they have to under, so they can understand the assessment tools? I think the answer is is no, although I could see value in people understanding each other's assessment tools. What this does is cuts through the need to actually do that, right? That's right. Yeah. You don't, uh, because you can color code, all the color coding is customizable as well, because you can color code all the answers. You don't really need to understand the answer so much as if you see that color, you can know, okay, you know, that's trending above a threshold where, you know, uh, my partner is concerned about this. Um, you don't need to be concerned about it as much, but you, you that way you will see, ah, there's psychosis concern. I don't know what a three means on a CANS if I'm coming from, you know, maybe juvenile justice. I don't know. Say so it could be go zero to hundred, three slow, low, very low. I don't, you know, three, but three is orange. Ah, I see that's a concern. So now I don't know anything about this, but I know that there's a concern here from my partner in, in psychosis. Kate, thank you very much. We are out of time, um, but want to express appreciation again on behalf of Breaking Barriers, and uh, we'll invite folks uh, to move on to the next session. Apologize we couldn't get to um, uh, any other questions. Uh, Kate, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you.